All right, guys, so we have our render here and it's looking pretty good, but we want to render this with the best possible settings. So I'm going to show you guys how you can set that up. So what we want to do is go into our sequencer here, go up to the top here, and we're going to click on this little button right here. And that's going to bring up our movie render queue. If you don't have that set up, uh, you can click down here uh, on this little arrow. And instead of clicking on movie scene capture, which is the old system of rendering, you're going to click on movie render queue. And that's going to give you a lot more options. So uh, I'll show you guys how you can set up a normal render and also how you can set up a path trace render. So what we do here is go into our settings. And uh, this is our default uh, export settings. You can always load and save a preset up here. So I already have some presets saved in this project. I'm going to get rid of this JPEG sequence. You know, I don't really like to use JPEGs. It's only 8-bit color and it's not very good. So you can use any of these formats. Uh, I would highly recommend using an EXR sequence if you're doing like you know, really high level production quality stuff. That's going to give you 16 bit color. So you're going to have basically total control over the entire image. Uh, it's going to retain all the highlight information, all the shadow information. And it's also going to give you a ton of flexibility with the color. So if you're doing really high quality production level stuff, I'd recommend an EXR sequence. It's also going to take up the most amount of data on your computer. So it's going to be a large file. So if you're rendering, you know, long sequences or something, that's something to keep in mind. But EXR sequence is a very good option. I'm not going to do EXR. It's a little more information than I really need for this particular project. So uh, what I like to often do, uh, you can do a PNG sequence, but once again, these are only 8-bit color. Uh, I like to use uh, Apple ProRes. It's a very common editing file type. So I'll usually do uh, ProRes 422HQ, which is 10-bit color. Uh, if you do 444, that is 12-bit uh, color, which is really good. So 10-bit uh, is good, 12-bit's great. You know, once again, it's really, it depends on how big a file size you want and what you're doing for your particular project. So I'm just going to do Apple ProRes 422HQ on here. And this is our deferred rendering. So this is the typical renderer that, you know, we usually use inside of Unreal. This is going to give you real-time rendering or, you know, it's going to try to render it in real time. It's using lit mode in terms of lighting. And, you know, if you have your ray tracing set up in your uh, camera, like we talked about earlier, that's going to allow you to, you know, have that pretty nice looking ray traced render. It's not full, you know, true ray tracing, but it's the uh, estimated ray tracing done by Unreal. So deferred rendering is a good option. And then we can go down here to our output. And we just set our output directory, which is just where the file is going to be stored. We can change the file format, file name format. So we can just, you know, call this um, UE course render, for example. And you can set your output resolution. This is going to be uh, partially based on the sensor size that you set up. So I've actually changed my sensor size around a little bit and uh, just to mess with it. And I also actually ended up changing the aspect ratio. I just went widescreen. You don't have to do that. You can just leave it by a 16 by 9 DSLR, but I just wanted to kind of mess with the look of it. So I went to 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio. So if we want to render this in 4K, it'll be 3840 by 1632 if we are at the 2 three, five to one aspect ratio. Uh, this doesn't necessarily have to match up exactly with your sensor size. It will just have black bars, I believe, uh, on the top and bottom if you render it at a higher resolution or a slightly different aspect ratio. So it's not a big deal. You can use your custom frame rate. I set mine to 24 FPS, which is film. But if you set your 23.976, you might have to change it. So just be aware of that. Uh, you want it to match up with your sequence settings, which is, you can find that right here. Uh, an important thing, I have this Niagara actor in here, um, which is just this smoke kind of coming up in the background. What we want to do is, so we want to set this so that the engine has some warm-up frames, because otherwise these uh, particles in the background will just kind of spawn out of nowhere, and uh, they won't be there for most of the shot, actually, because they'll just still be kind of rising and pluming up into the atmosphere. So we don't want that. So what we can do is... Um, do an anti-aliasing setting, and this is going to help you in uh, several ways. So what we can do is go down here and do our engine warm-up count, and we're going to set this to something high like 250 frames. That's about uh, 10 and a half seconds approximately. So that's going to give these particles 10 and a half seconds to get up into the air and kind of doing their thing. It's also going to give any other particle simulation or anything like that. It's going to give it some time to get going before we actually, you know, capture our frames from Unreal. 
So uh, that's a good thing that you can set up there. You don't really have to mess with this too much because Unreal already does some anti-aliasing, which you can control. So if we look up here, uh, we can see our anti-aliasing uh, settings. And there's also settings in your project settings, but uh, generally you can kind of leave those as is. Anyway, uh, so that's a basic set up for our render if we're rendering this in real time. Okay, so that's pretty much all you need to do. You can hit accept and then you can go in here to your movie render queue and just click render. Now I want to show you guys how you can render a path traced version. Going into path tracing mode we lose all of our uh, volumetric fog and things start to look a little weird. Uh, so just bear with me here. But uh, I just want to show you guys kind of how you would set this up if you were to render out of path tracing mode. So Unreal Engine 4.27 is the only version that currently has this ability. So just keep that in mind. You can leave this the same. You can leave the anti-aliasing. We're going to get into that later. And you can leave the output as the same, whatever. Uh, it's the same type of settings. So what we want to do, though, is get rid of this deferred rendering. And we're going to go up here to our settings. And we're going to click on Path Tracer. Now we have our Path Tracer renderer. That's, it's going to render using the path tracer uh, we don't need to actually do any more in these settings what we do need to change though is these anti-aliasing settings so the way that path tracing works in terms of the render is it takes your spatial sample count and it multiplies it by the temporal sample count and that generates the total samples for your project so if I go to my post process volume if I go in here and we find the path tracing settings you know we have our max bounces we have our samples and I'm gonna set this down like 500 for the sake of my computer and uh, we have these other settings here we're gonna uncheck the denoiser because it you know if you have enough samples you're not really gonna have any noise in your image the denoiser in Unreal Engine is pretty destructive so if we turn this on uh, I don't know if you'll be able to see it in this particular shot because it takes a while for Unreal to like actually calculate all the samples for the bounces. It basically gets rid of a ton of detail and it's not really a good thing to use. I would prefer to use DaVinci's denoising software. So if you have another way of denoising, I would recommend using that. I like to turn that off. Uh, however, if you go up here and we can set our max bounces, this is like, you know, we can set this to probably four and it's not really going to make much of a difference if any difference and this is going to save your computer a little bit but the samples per pixel for the path tracer uh, is actually not set in your post process volume it's actually set in the renderer so uh, this is where these sample counts come in uh, so these actually multiply together to give you your sample count. The way that works is the spatial sample count calculates the look of each pixel in terms of, you know, brightness, color, and all that. Based on the light that's in the scene and the light that's coming in, it shoots light rays into the scene and it bounces them around to get realistic looking lighting for your scene. But when you render using the path tracer, uh, because because it calculates each pixel and you know it's calculating all these different lighting it does so in each frame individually and then when you play that back sometimes it's very jittery and it doesn't look right because it's only taking into account the individual frames it's not taking into account the shot as a whole which is multiple frames so what the temporal sample count does is it kind of helps to balance each frame with the frames around it by taking samples from other frames and kind of interpolating that so that it doesn't look jittery when you play it back and the noise isn't bouncing around everywhere and it doesn't look bad. You want to have a pretty decent total amount of samples. I find that some, if I'm rendering at 4K, I like to have somewhere around, you know, at least like 121 samples. That would be 11 spatial samples and 11 temporal samples. Uh, I find that usually works pretty well. Uh, you can go a little higher if you need to, but usually when I'm rendering using the path tracer, I'm not really getting much of any noise using somewhere around like 121 samples. So, you know, the, the fewer samples that you have, the quicker your render time is going to be. You want to take that into account because, you know, rendering a shot like this is probably going to take around six to eight hours when I'm rendering with 121 samples. If I'm rendering with 500 samples, that's going to pretty much take all day, I would imagine. I've never actually tried it, but you want to keep that in mind when you're rendering. If you're rendering at 1080p, however, you could have a higher sample count, but honestly, you're probably not going to need it because you're at a lower resolution. So it would just kind of be a waste of time. So rendering this shot at 1080p is probably going to take you, you know, three to four hours, about half the time because it's half the resolution. So, you know, you have to take that into account and just keep that in mind.
So I'm going to set this to 11 by 11, okay? And that's going to bring up an error for us. So uh, it's greater than the number of TAA samples, uh, which is the temporal uh, anti-aliasing samples, which is currently 8. So it's ineffective, and you should consider overriding it to none for better quality. So we're going to just override the anti-aliasing. So yeah, we have our engine warm-up count set up. That's going to take care of our Niagara actors, and that's pretty much all you need to do for the path tracer. I would just recommend making sure that you have this denoiser turned off. So we can go down here to our output, and uh, everything looks good. So we can click accept, and then you go just go down here and click render, and you're going to have your shot.